Funding for this talk comes from TrialX, connecting patients to clinical trials. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Cure Talks. I'm Priya Menon, your host. Today on Cure Talks, we are discussing COVID-19 pandemic and what to expect with infectious disease specialist Dr. Stephen Pergam from Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. Talking to Dr. Pergam on the patient panel are patient advocates Gary Peterson, Jack Aiello, Cynthia Shmilovsky, and Yelik Biro. Now to get the discussion started, uh, we have with us Dr. Stephen Pergam, Associate Member of Vaccine and Infectious Disease Division and Clinical Research at Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. Dr. Pergam, first of all, I want to thank you for coming on our show to inform and educate us today. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, really appreciate it and, and hope we can be helpful. Uh, Dr. Pergam, uh, as we all know, we have a pandemic on us and uh, we are scrambling. So there is no current uh, proven treatment or cure for COVID-19 and scientists around the world are working to find one. So what are some of the drug names that are floating around and what do we know about them? Yeah, it's a great uh, question. So um, one that has been talked about probably um, the most in the media recently has um, been the drug hydroxychloroquine. Um, hydroxychloroquine is a drug that's usually used for um, systemic uh, lupus erythematous and um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, amongst others. Um, it's also a drug that's used um, in its chloroquine form more frequently uh, for prevention of malaria. Um, it's been a drug that has had um, some uh, evaluations in the past for other viral diseases, and it looks really good in vitro, meaning in the in sort of the lab. But actually, in clinical um, scenarios, maybe not quite as dramatic. And so I think many people are kind of waiting for major clinical trials to sort of come together to determine if this is really effective. There's been some concern as there's been some national media that have really promoted this as a potential pathway. And I think um, what we don't want is we don't want people to rush out and buy this at the pharmacy. And there's a really interesting trial that's going to be happening here at the University of Minnesota in um, the United States where they're actually evaluating this in people that have either been exposed or have early symptoms um, amongst normal, otherwise um, healthy people um, to see if that actually has a benefit. But I think that it's still an unproven therapy, unfortunately. Um, there is a small study um, comparing um, people that um, did get hydrochloroquine um, and, and with the addition of a drug called azithromycin um, that was done by Didier Raoul and colleagues in France. Um, it's a small study of about 30 patients, and it looked like there was potentially a benefit of that um, combination trial, but I would caution anyone to believe that that's the definitive answer. I think we need really good randomized clinical trials to really identify what's going on. My, the example I've given in other situations is a drug called Kaletra, which is a combination therapy for HIV. It was thought to potentially be effective in the lab and got rolled out in many locations um, around the country, and people were scrambling to get the drug. Um, but a recent um, clinical trial came through through China that um, did not show effectiveness. Um, so um, that's kind of fallen out of favor. So I think we need to be cautious about all these different agents that are talked about early. The ones that I think, I think are most potentially exciting um, is there's a drug called remdesivir, um, which is a drug uh, that's produced by Gilead, and there is an ongoing randomized clinical trial um, for patients with um, uh, more severe disease. They have to be, I believe, hospitalized on oxygen to be eligible for that trial. Um, previously, it was being given, um, you could get it through a couple of different mechanisms, um, but now it's only through the NIH trial. And that, I think, the early data looked promising in that, um, but that, again, is still ongoing. So we'll be waiting to see what the results look like from that. Um, there's a new drug um, that is being investigated in Japan, which is not currently available. There's only been some early reports in the news media about it, but none of us have seen actual data. And I believe it's, I believe the name is Farapavir. Um, I'm probably mispronouncing that and misspelling it, but it, there's too many names out there. Um, but that's another one that's um, being discussed on, on a couple of different levels, but we haven't actually seen um, much of that data yet. And then I think there's some other um, aspects that um, are interesting. So uh, there's a drug called tocilizumab, which is an IL-6 inhibitor um, that's used primarily in cancer therapy um, that has <clears throat> potentially some um, have thought that this might be beneficial in preventing some of the really severe pulmonary complications late in disease. 
But again, um, very small studies um, need more data, and it's an ex incredibly expensive drug, so very hard at the moment to consider that as a, as a worldwide usage. Um, and I think not enough data to suggest that it's useful for all patient populations, and certainly not for the, the person at home. And then I think finally, I think what's most probably the most promising of all is um, people with convalescent serum. So what you can do in patients who've been exposed is you can, um, uh, who've had COVID-19, have documented COVID-19, have recovered their serum and then um, do passive transfer of that serum to patients who are really ill. That provides an opportunity to potentially treat patients um, with um, preformed antibodies and that might really help them. Um, and there's been a lot of data with other viral diseases that has shown um, a lot of benefit from that regard. So that is, I think, probably the most exciting. There are another um, group of agents that are um, being worked on, and those are specific monoclonal antibodies that people are focusing on specifically um, for treatment. They're being developed to target the, um, the virus. Um, there are other um, agents that are out and being discussed, um, which are um, um, sort of homologs for ACE2, um, which is the primary uh, receptor on, in the body for um, COVID-19. Um, but those are all early in process, and none of those are really at a place where um, they could have widespread use. So really the answer is we don't have a, a, have a, proven, trial, a, a proven drug yet. And so the best um, approach to prevent um, COVID-19 is, is, is to, not, uh, to, to really work on social distancing, washing your hands, and, and staying away from getting in the first place. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Uh, Pergam, how long uh, do you think it's going to take for an effective treatment to come through um, at your optimist best, that is? And uh, well, I, I also want to club yeah, this with, yeah. Um, yeah, sorry. I also want to club this with one of the audience questions that came in um, oh. asking uh, which antivirals vaccines may be available uh, if this returns next fall? So let me take the first question first. How soon can we yeah. have a trial that shows benefit? Um, mm -hmm. I think being that there's so many cases that are um, developed around the world at the moment, um, clinical trials are enrolling rapidly. That's a matter of getting those trials analyzed and presenting that data on a national level um, and an international level. Um, what's been really um, wonderful about the experience, if there is one you know, good thing that's come out of this, is how much research has been produced around COVID-19 so quickly. So the rapid dissemination of information through preprint articles and um, word of mouth has been very important. And so I think some of those early data will be quickly um, presented. So journals like The Lancet or the New England Journal or JAMA are really ready and prepared and getting fast turnaround for reviews um, to get these um, trials into public records so that people can use them to make treatment decisions. My hope is that um, sometime um, by maybe the end of April, early June, we'll have some early results from some of the data from um, China regarding the um, remdesivir trials that they've done. Um, there will be additional data on hydroxychloroquine and other combination therapies or combination therapies, including remdesivir and hydrochloroquine um, that will be coming out from China and um, other um, locations like Italy. Um, there's a lot of ongoing trials in those areas where there's um, a large amount of disease, and hopefully some of those will help inform um, what we're doing for the next few months. So that would be potentially the best-case scenario. It might take longer than that, but that, I think, is what many of us are really hoping is that we'll get some, some hint of what might be effective. I will warn people it's possible that all of these therapies that we've been talking about at the end of the day don't show much benefit. Um, antivirals are more difficult to produce than the antibacterials in many ways. Um, and so uh, it, it does take a little more time and a little more, um, a little more effort to sort of put them together. Um, so it may not be immediate. Um, in terms of vaccines, I think most would argue that <clears throat> in a best case scenario, we might have a vaccine in maybe a year, a year and a half. Um, there is at least one vaccine trial that is ongoing. There are others that are being planned. Um, um, there's a company called Moderna, which is doing a vaccine trial with an RNA-based um, vaccine. Um, but a lot of these are um, very early in the phases. Vaccine trials in general are incredibly time-consuming because they have to demonstrate efficacy. Um, they have to demonstrate safety. And there's a rigorous pr um, a process to get vaccines approved. 
So my expectation is a best case scenario, we have a vaccine in a year and a half, and that would be moving the process quickly. So I, I think um, we need to be focusing on prevention, um, um, again, because that's going to be really important. So I would love to have something earlier than that, but I think that's probably um, being realistic. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Dr. Bergam. So I'm just going to hand this over to uh, Gary Peterson so he can start uh, with the patient uh, panel as well. Uh, Gary, you're sure. on air. Please ask your questions. Yes. Uh, thank you, doctor, very much uh, for a couple of things, the first of which is, you know, you you are the very, you know, the, the first patient um, was actually landed uh, from China in Seattle Tacoma International Airport on January 15th. So you have the longest experience, and all of us who are on this panel uh, have defeated to some extent, uh, a terminal cancer. Um, and as a result, you know, uh, we have immune systems that are very, very badly compromised. So um, I would like to know um, if you've had a lot of experience with uh, at the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance to, uh, with people with uh, immune systems that have comprom been compromised, and given that, are there things that can be done for that set of people uh, who get the disease that can help them um, improve? So that's a, um, an important question. <clears throat> you know, some of our goals in the way we we treat patients here is we have a really robust system of infection prevention to hope that we don't get patients that are infected in the first place. And although we've had cases that probably have been in the community and there's been some have spread at some level, um, a lot of what initially happened was it was not detected. So we had a patient come in January, but we were not seeing large components of community spread um, in the early phases. So only recently in the past, you know, four weeks or so, have we really been in a situation where there's been um, community transmission more prominently? At the moment, we have not had um, a large number of cancer patients who've been infected, um, and we've seen so far a variance in what they look like. Um, we've had some that have come in very ill. Um, we've had some that have come in with mild symptoms, and we've had some that have recovered. Um, so it, it kind of depends a lot. Um, as you can imagine, cancer is not one particular illness. It's a varied mix and milieu of what it is. It's people on therapy. It's people who've had recovery. Um, it's people that have transplants. It's people that have um, hematologic or bone marrow um, cancers. Um, so it's quite different. And the level of immune suppression is varied amongst those groups. So it may be very different. Um, the other thing that clearly we know is a risk factor is not only having potentially a cancer or a, a malignancy, is also the things that come along with it. Um, so often um, we see this in people that are older, um, so people that fit the age criteria that would put them at higher risk for developing complications from COVID-19, um, being a 65 and older for sure. Um, people that have another organ dysfunction, so either lung disease or heart disease or kidney disease um, can also increase your risk. So I think the combination, in my view, is really what puts cancer patients at most at risk, is that common, the combination of comorbid problems, um, things that they have in their, in their health history beyond their cancer, the addition of immune suppression or the cancer itself, and then um, um, age, which oftentimes is associated. So I think Right now, unfortunately, my colleagues in New York are probably um, seeing a lot more of these cases and have more experience about the, the variety of what they're seeing um, because it's so um, it's transmitting much more prominently in those areas. But I think for us, it's it's been really trying to identify these patients early um, and watching them very closely. What we do know is that patients who develop um, this particular illness can present with mild symptoms um, initially. Um, so it's important to reach out to your physicians, talk to people ahead of time, to call ahead to your clinics. If you have fever, if you have cough, if you've noticed some shortness of breath, 
Um, if you have, um, you know, on, new onset diarrhea that's really, um, you know, unexpected and not related to one of the medications you're on, or if you are um, developing sort of a general um, sort of muscle aches and really profound fatigue that is not expected. Um, and we've seen some patients present with headaches, and there's a whole variety of complications. But usually a couple of those symptoms together um, would be something that we would, we would recommend, at least telling your team, you know, I think I might have something going on, and let them sort of walk you through the next steps. Because sometimes the best thing to do is not go directly to your clinic, but to stay at home and see how those symptoms progress. If it's really important for you to be seen, your cancer doctors can advise you the best way to do that safely. So if you are infected, you don't infect others during your arrival on your evaluation in the clinic or in the hospital space. And if you are feeling sick enough that you're feeling very short-winded, um, you're really concerned, you have a fever, and you, you, you don't have adequate um, cells to fight infection, um, that would be a time when you'd want to call ahead to the emergency room or your care team and say, I need to be seen right away, and they can help you sort of sort through that process. So there's a lot of different ways to do that. But I think, you know, our estimations and our thoughts are that patients who have cancer who develop this will develop more severe complications um, because in general what we've seen is that if you're older in your 70s and 80s um, and you develop complications, we know that people as they age develop um, more immune deficits. There's a particular condition called immune senescence where your immune system is a little, it, it sort of ages along with you, and so it doesn't fight infections as well. And our assumption is that um, if that's true, that that's the population that's getting very ill, that it might be that um, as people who don't have adequate immune systems get these illnesses, they will get more um, sick. So I think the, the key pieces, again, um, is just sort of watching yourself, watching your symptoms, talking to your teams, and letting people know ahead of time before you come into clinic. Um, I think those are really important concepts to get across. And, you know, we can talk about prevention strategies in a moment, but I think those are some things that I think are the most advantageous. And um, what we're really worried about is people developing uh, pulmonary complications. Um, we've seen some patients develop um, uh, heart involvement or myocarditis or inflammation of the heart has been described um, across um, across the world um, in patients who develop this complication. And the other thing that we've seen a little more frequently in these patients are um, thrombotic complications where they get blood clots um, in their veins. Um, and that seems to be from the inflammatory process itself. So those are some of the early findings that I think um, that people are describing in patients. And the data on cancer is actually not very deep at the moment. Um, there's a small paper in Lancet Hematology that describes 18 patients. Um, there's bits and pieces um, in some of the Chinese literature, but it's, there's not been much that is really um, sort of separated out different groups and what their complications are. They're usually lumped together, which makes it hard to sort of advise people about what we should expect to see. Um, again, we, we've been really lucky, I'll knock on wood, um, that we have not seen a, a large number of cases, but we're fully expecting to see more in our system as it spreads in the community more and more. Well, recently we've... Uh at least in our small, I guess about probably 50 people in our IMF support group in the last mm -hmm. two weeks have seen two people come down with infection, one of which was, quote, a unknown virus um, mm -hmm. and uh, passed away very quickly with, uh, with pneumonia, double pneumonia, yeah. and that type of yep. thing. And that's the kind of yep. thing that just happens to us. You know, we get sick, right. we, right. you know, it just happens, it, it overcomes us. Our immune system is, is lower. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the things that I had read recently, and it might have been a similar article to yours, was that um, this is caused by, and some, you know, the lung damage is caused by a cytokine storm. And yeah. uh, mm -hmm. we see the cytokine storm ourselves from uh, CAR T. Yeah, and absolutely. the same thing yeah. happens to us in CAR T. But mm -hmm. everybody mm -hmm. uh, has now, at least the myeloma folks, have found ways to uh, prevent the, the CAR T from creating the cytokine storm that kills us. 
So I was wondering yeah. if something like that might be applicable. And and I'm just asking this because I, I just read an article and it just made all the sense in the world to me. Yeah. Yeah, so um, there is a drug called, um, for car T-cell therapy, there's a drug called tocilizumab, which is an IL-6 inhibitor, and IL-6 seems to be a primary driver of a lot of this cytokine storm. And there's actually a lot of interest in that being a potential therapeutic option. Um, again, the problem with tocilizumab is its cost, so it makes it hard to sort of widely use it. Um, it's currently oh, we know all about supply. cost. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, nobody cares about cost, right? We we have to focus on that, I guess. But I think the important thing is um, it's actually in sh- a little bit of a shortage because people have been using it around the world to try it as a potential therapy. So I think there's a lot of interest in that. That if you could turn off this inflammatory response from the virus, is that um, enough to protect patients? We don't know. Um, we do know that involvement of the virus itself can um, can cause damage to the lungs. So it may not be sufficient. Um, but it could slow down the process and allow people to recover. Um, there's also been descriptions of it being used to prevent people from needing to go to the ICU and um, to need to be on a ventilator. Um, but again, because it, there isn't um, really a lot of data yet about it, we, we've been looking at it and I think um, have even used it in a couple of situations, but it has, um, it, right now we just, we just don't know enough about the best way to use it. My colleagues who I spoke to um, in detail about this in Italy <clears throat> are doing studies with this now. And one of, the question, one of the comments that they made to me was they said, you don't want to give it too early because if you give it too early, you don't get the benefit. And you don't want to give it too late because then it's too late to, to help people. So trying to find that sweet spot where it might be helpful um, is part of the challenge. But I think it's a great point and one thing that we're looking at closely. The other um, a comparator to that, which is a little more of a blunt instrument, is something um, like prednisone or um, systemic steroids, um, which has sometimes been used in people with really severe lung disease. And there's a lot of debate about whether that is beneficial or not, because usually that weakens the immune system further. And um, it may help the short-term process, but doesn't help the long game. Um, so it's unclear whether that's beneficial. And again, those are um, studies that are ongoing. You know, I, I'll say this. I, I can understand the frustration from a cancer patient. You want to hurry up and get these studies done and figure this out. Um, it is super important. And I know everyone is focusing highly on what are effective therapies. Um, it's This is a process that is necessary. If we run too fast and we put all of our eggs in one basket and try to figure out that that is the solution and we find that it doesn't work, um, we've really um, sent patients down a negative pathway that hasn't been beneficial um, to them. So I think all of us need to be cautious about stepping up to new treatments, but we're looking around the corners. We're pulling up new agents that are out there. We've been um, communicating with pharmaceutical companies on a regular basis for products that they think might be helpful. And um, there's been a lot of support from the cancer community with different ideas. And one thing we are doing is we're talking on a regular basis um, with our transplant community, both in Europe and in um, the United States, to try to understand what are the best therapies that people are seeing and what are results that, that might be beneficial. And those calls are happening at least once a week um, so that we can quickly update guidelines and give people new information depending on what people are seeing. So we're all talking through different channels about what they see and what they're finding effective. Um, it's been really helpful from that perspective to talk about that. But the tocilizumab is interesting, and I think there's a lot of um, – people that would like to see more about this, um, but I think those trials are coming. Okay, well, thank you so much, Doctor. Uh, we have um, um, a time schedule for this, and I think I just ran over mine, and it's 10 minutes That's per okay. person. So it's no going to be hard breaks, and I'm going to hard break right now for Jack Aiello. Okay. Thanks, Gary, and thank you, Dr. Bergram, for uh, being on this call. Sure. I, no uh Wanted to ask a couple of questions. Some patients are dependent on blood products. Any chance of transmitting the virus uh, via blood transfusions of any kind? Not that we're aware of. There are specific, the the blood transfusion um, uh, organizations have come out with some specific guidelines for when and and if you can, when you can donate blood. Um, So there's a lot of work um, being done in that space um, to better identify that. Um, We are not aware that that's a particular pathway of infection. 
Um, this is a primary respiratory infection, and usually respiratory infections are not transmitted through blood. So, you know, for flu as an example, we don't necessarily um, expect that if somebody had flu the day beforehand, you collected blood and gave it to someone that they would necessarily develop flu. The, the organism itself um, has attachment points at places that, um, you know, are primarily focused in the airways and in the lungs, although there are many other locations in the body as well. And so I think for, for most, um, most individuals, we don't think that that's, that's a primary method. Um, there is work okay. going on in that space. The problem is, is that some of the tests we use to identify um, the virus um, are these PCR polymerase chain reaction, and what we find is parts of the virus, but we can't tell whether it's live or dead. And so, <clears throat> and, you know, I think in a lot of situations, they're just being cautious about how um, blood donations are happening. There's been new uh, regulations that have been put in place to help protect against that. So I think blood transfusions, I would not worry about. There's a lot of work and a lot of people that are in that space trying to protect patients who are getting um, blood transfusions. Um, I would say, um, one of the challenges that has come up that was a surprise to us was that blood transfusions um, have been difficult to get. So getting an adequate blood supply was something that was unexpected because as all these social distancing efforts have taken place in Seattle, it got harder to bring people in to, yeah. do, blood, uh, trans, uh, to, to do blood donations. So there's been a lot of work here to expand that and to even a lot of our staff at the um, Seattle Cancer Care Alliance went in and donated blood um, because we wanted to make sure there was adequate supply. And I think we're in good shape now, but that's been something that's happened nationally, which was a bit of a surprise and, and it makes sense in, re in, in retrospect, but it wasn't something we'd planned around. How reliable is the COVID-19 testing? Are there a higher than normal percentage of false positives or false negatives? Well, you know, there's a bunch of different assays out there. Um, the WHO assay, there was an assay that was developed in China. Um, there's a number of other assays. We have one here that was developed in our own um, lab. Um, <clears throat> it's hard to know um, exactly the performance characteristics of these lab tests. Um, what we've seen is that people that are positive clearly are infected and have symptoms that are consistent. Um, I don't, you know, there's been reports of false negatives where initially someone is negative and then they develop more prominent symptoms and they're tested again and are positive. It may be that people are tested at time points where there's not a lot of virus in um, the nose or in the nasopharynx where these um, nasopharyngeal swabs go. Um, <clears throat> so it, it may just be a timing issue um, rather than the amount of virus that's there. Sometimes it's also a sampling issue that these these nasal pharyngeal swabs are kind of uncomfortable if you've ever had one. They kind of poke yeah. in the back and kind of almost go to the back of your throat. Um, and so if they're not done correctly, you may not get enough um, of the virus. And so there's, it's not clear. Um, we have not seen a lot of uh, false positives, ones that repeated negative right away. Um, I can't say that I can tell you of any. And generally what we've seen is we've seen if the test is positive, it's positive. Um, I can only think of one case out of all of the patients we've seen here um, that was negative initially and then um, had a test that was positive later. Um, and that might have been somebody that had a late exposure and then developed more complications um, and had more, more development of disease. So my sense is that false positives on our side at least have been relatively infrequent. Or excuse me, false negatives have been relatively infrequent. Um, but about I think what's been reported, at least in many places, is um, about 20%, and, and that, that's not at least what we're seeing. Um, but I think it really depends on the performance characteristics of the assay itself, and since there's a bunch of them out there, it, it is really dependent. Um, my general take on this is there may be patients that have really severe pneumonia that don't have a lot of um, virus in their nose, but I don't think the data supports that at the moment. Um, it looks like the nose and the nasopharynx are places where there should be plenty of virus. So it may be related to testing. It may be related to the specific assay. Um, but I think as time goes on, these assays are going to get better and better, and they're going to be more specific. So I think the issues with false positives um, is probably going to be something that will um, dissipate over time, and certainly false negatives. We hope that will dissipate as well. And then just maybe a quick response to the question that I'll, I'm going to follow up with Gary's. Uh, we mm -hmm. talked about immune-compromised patients, mm -hmm. and you yeah. indicated that, you know, there's a lot of heterogeneity mm -hmm. there in terms of 
not all cancer patients are the same. Are there any kind of lab markers or, you know, we're getting blood tests all the time that we should look at to determine our level of immune compromised? Yeah, I mean, there's some things that are helpful, I guess. <clears throat> um, so, first of all, there's no great single marker that I can send on anyone that tells me your level of immune compromise. So, um, there is no perfect assay that will tell me that you're at risk for X infection or, or Y um, virus. It, it's just not easy to do. Our immune systems are incredibly complex, and we've seen this with cancer therapies, where when you knock out a component of the immune system, you're at risk for uh, complications that you know you'd never, uh, we would never have expected, um, and certain infections that are rare um, in most populations but show up because of the way the immune system's been affected. That's targeted to one small aspect of it. Um, but what we look at generally is, I would think that patients who are getting treatment for um, um, cancers that involve the hematologic system, so particularly <clears throat> people that have um, weaknesses in their immune cells. So if you look at your um, your neutrophil count, if it's really low, if you're below 500, um, we would expect that you would probably be at increased risk. Um, patients that have low lymphocyte counts, so very low, um, what we typically assume are, are agents that are um, fighting against um, most viral infections. Those are low. Those would um, potentially put patients at risk. And then um, patients who are getting um, therapies that might weaken their ability to produce antibodies um, against um, a viral infection might make it so that they have more complications too. So a drug like rituxan, um, which is used a lot of times um, in patients with lymphoma, um, might either um, lead to a prolonged shedding of the virus because you don't produce um, adequate antibodies or potentially um, more complications. You know, it's entirely possible, and we don't know this for sure, but that some of these therapies may actually um, not be all bad. Um, it is possible that certain components of these immune therapies or um, the treatments that patients are on um, may limit the immune response and may not may help you to prevent getting um, severe inflammatory conditions in the lung. Um, what we're not sure is whether that's all good because it could be damaged um, if the virus continues to replicate um, to the lung specifically from uh, the virus might not be um, in the best interest. So it, there, there may be two different ways that the virus can cause problems. Um, so in general, those are the things that I think are the most easy to look at for most patients. So if they look at their complete blood count and look at their levels, um, if their neutrophils are low or their lymphocytes are low, that's probably a good predictor. And if they are getting um, immune globulin or are told their immunoglobulin levels are low, that might be another potential indication that they might be at increased risk. And generally, it's people with bone marrow cancers or um, cancers that involve the immune system itself that I think are probably going to be at the highest risk. Thanks so much. I'll turn it over to Cindy Chmielewski. So thank you so much for spending your time. And I was just following up a little bit on Jack's question. Most of the patients sure. living, listening to this um, show would be myeloma patients. And myeloma uh -huh. is a cancer of the immune system. So I guess we're yeah. Yeah. pretty much at risk. Um, but uh -huh. also in our like monthly labs, we usually get our immune immunoglobulins checked, or IgG, or IgA, or IgM. Yeah. Now, if mm -hmm. those levels are basically within the range, would you mm -hmm. consider it not being as immune compromised as someone whose levels may be off range or no? Well, <clears throat> I think myeloma is a, a particularly um, challenging group um, because um, the disease itself involves the plasma cell. And what we've, what we've known for a long time is that myeloma patients tend to be at higher risk for developing viral complications. Um, for a lot of you, I'm sure, um, you're also on, if you've had an auto transplant or you've gotten CAR T-cell therapy, um, many of you um, are on maintenance therapies with things like bortezomab or um, uh, lenalidomide. Um, and so we don't know exactly how those long-term agents might affect you. Um, so m my expectation is that if you have a normal um, immunoglobulin level, that's good. Um, that doesn't hurt you for sure. Um, but not having um, an immunoglobulin level that's that's low does not mean you're you're necessarily protected. So I wouldn't imagine your immunoglobulin levels are necessarily predictive of safety. 
I just worry about people who don't have adequate immunoglobulin levels, that their body's not producing enough immunoglobulin um, by their B cells and some of the other um, immune processes that work in that way. And, um, I, I, you know, that would be, uh, that's probably more of my, my issue from that perspective. So I don't think uh, having a normal immunoglobulin mal- level means you're not at risk. So keep in mind that um, myeloma patients are probably at, at increased risk because they have in, involvement of the immune system itself in how um, we address um, infections. Okay. So yep. since we're at increased risk, we need to take increased precautions, I guess. And um, yeah. But many of us are still in treatment and we might have to travel to our treatment centers. What precautions sure. should be taken? Should we be wearing masks? Um, mm-hmm. Do you think we should be talking to our oncologist about maybe for a few months trying to do an all oral therapy? Should we skip the dex for a while? What types of recommendations would you make for my woman patients in treatment? Yeah, it's a really important question. Um, I think the way that I focus on this first is it's really important to talk to your oncologist and to keep in mind that they're the ones that are going to give you the best advice about how your disease needs to be treated. Um, for some myelomas, they're in a position where they can go on oral therapy and they can be monitored from a distance. They don't need to be seen every week. Um, and it might be an opportunity to talk about telehealth, where you could be calling in or video chatting about your current symptoms and how you're feeling. And if you could avoid coming into clinic, that might be fantastic. For others, um, you have to come in to get infusions. You have to come in to get blood products. Um, You might have to come in um, for dialysis if your kidney um, has been involved um, with myeloma. And so there are the realistic pieces here is that you need to be seen um, for your disease. So whenever possible, if it's possible, talk to your teams about what are options that you can do therapy where you don't need to be sort of on campus, I would say, or in the cancer center itself. Um, But remember that many cancer centers are incredibly focused on trying to protect you the best they can. So even when you do come in, um, they're doing all they can. So in our our particular situation um, in Seattle, everyone who comes in the door goes through intense screening, and anyone who is symptomatic gets swabbed for COVID-19. For those who don't need to have appointments, we send them on to other, you know, we try to reschedule them at different times. But for those who really need to come in, we, we see them in precautions. And then anyone who has a diagnosis of COVID-19, we follow very closely. We try not to bring them into clinic whenever possible. So we can follow them closely and, and monitor their symptoms. We call them basically twice daily to make sure they're doing okay. And if they do develop more complicated problems, we you know have them call ahead and go to an ER or, or and we directly admit them for uh, management in the hospital. Um, so what I, what I typically tell people is a couple of things is there's a lot you can do in your life to sort of protect yourself. And many of you do this anyways, because cancer patients, you know, they don't feel always the best. Um, so they're not out in public places as much. Um, you're also often advised during flu season to, you know, not only get your flu shot, but to, to try to distance yourself from people in general who are sick. Um, so I think certainly, um, staying at home as much as you can, avoiding, um, many, um, activities out in the community, if you can, that are, that are going to be high density, that doesn't mean you have to live as a hermit. Um, many people have to go get groceries. They need to get supplies for themselves. Um, what, if you have a delivery service with your, um, your local, um, um, grocery and they can deliver to your house even better, Um, just less contact. So think about every person you connect with and every time you're going someplace. Um, If you work and you're at an office where there's a bunch of people around, talk to your your boss and see if it's a possibility that you could work from home Uh, because that would be a good opportunity. Tell them why. Say I'm at risk for developing major complications and have that conversation one-on-one to let them know that not only do you want to protect your other employees um, by not bringing in something yourself, but that you are really worried that somebody might expose you to something. And be very okay. clear to family and friends that if they are ill, they should not come to see you. Even somebody with a mild cough um, or somebody with a little bit of a sore throat or they're not sure, they tell you it's their allergies, just say, please don't come see me during those time frames when you're having illness. 
Um, use lots of hand sanitizer when you're out in the community. Um, but masking in general, you know, it's it's not clear that a surgical mask wearing every day is going to be necessarily super protective. Um, so um, I would talk to your individual doctors about whether they think that's valuable. Um, certainly, if you have symptoms, you should wear a mask if possible when going to any appointments or going out into the community. So if you're having symptoms at home, if you have a mask that you can wear um, when you go out into um, a public space because you have to, um, then that's important. And I would really recommend that people with active symptoms not go out into public if possible. Um, and then finally, with your family members, just make sure they know that if they develop symptoms, and it's hard to do this for some people, but to kind of um, isolate themselves from you if possible um, and to go get tested. And if they do have an infection, to find, if possible, another place where they could be. That's not always super easy, and um, there's a lot of issues with um, how to manage that. But um, as much as you can stay apart and wash your hands very carefully, that can be helpful, I think, um, to potentially prevent uh, transmission in the household. Thank you so much. And since we're on limited time, anyway, why don't you go ahead with your questions? Sure. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I sure can. Yeah, thanks again for time uh, between us today and uh, give us a little bit more information about uh, what's going on with uh, this virus. Can you go back yeah. to the basics and explain the difference between bacteria, fungus, and uh, virus? And if yeah, are, sure. uh, we have a broad spectrum antibiotics, why don't yeah. normally have a broad spectrum antiviral? Yeah. <clears throat> so let's let's talk about that. Those are really different conditions. So um, bacteria are bigger organisms. Um, they, um, you know, our, our intestinal, um, uh, our intestinal components of stool is full of bacteria. Our mouths are full of bacteria. They live sort of symbiotically with us. And we actually have some types of viruses that live with us that are called bacteriophages. <clears throat> they actually infect and sort of um, transmit information between um, bacteria as well. Um, there are also some viruses that live in our system. Some of you may have had complications with a, a virus called CMV or um, shingles would be another. It's the, that's the chickenpox virus. So some viruses that after exposure we um, sort of have latent, um, latently that live in our systems. And so there's a variety of different ways that those can be. But the largest of those groups um, is um, fungi. So things, um, molds like aspergillus. And those are ones that are really prominently cause um, illness, mostly in the lung, um, in patients who have low uh, neutrophil counts, and most prominently in patients who are getting bone marrow transplant and patients that have uh, types of leukemia, where they have very low neutrophil counts for an extended period of time. Um, and that usually um, presents as cough and pneumonia and often um, fever, sometimes they'll, um, patients will cough up blood, and those typically are treated with antifungal agents, which take um, often months um, to clear up. Um, those are often diagnosed um, either by blood tests or by doing a, a bronchoscopy, where you go down in the lung and wash the lung with some fluid and then send it for the lab for identification. Um, so fungi are more often exposures in the community. So you're breathing fungi everywhere. So they're, you know, anything that's like bread mold and things like that are um, possibilities. If you leave anything out for too long, it'll, molds are important to break down uh, things in the environment. Um, but I think it's really an important, um, they're important infections in our, in our populations. Bacteria typically lead to things like bacteremia, where you have, you're told you have E. coli in your bloodstream <clears throat> those can cause um, shaking chills and fever, um, something called sepsis, where you get really sick um, and need to go to the ICU. And um, they can also lead to things like pneumonia or urinary tract infections. And some bacteria can also involve um, the intestinal lining um, with something like C. diff um, that can do that. But those are organisms that we have particular agents for as well. So we've got antibacterials that target components of those um, organisms. And it's a little bit easier when you have a bigger organism like a fungus or a bacteria to identify a particular target. Viruses tend to be small. They replicate very quickly. And for some, <clears throat> they can develop um, resistance um, more easily to an antiviral. So 
we have a couple of um, antivirals that work really well for specific conditions. So we have a treatment for CMV. We have a number actually at this point in time that are treatments. Um, we have treatment for, uh, uh, for influenza. But for most common respiratory viruses like respiratory syncytial virus or metanumovirus or parainfluenza, <laughs> excuse me, parainfluenza, we don't um, have um, particular um, treatments for those. So we, we've struggled. Um, they're just harder to find um, good targets for them. And because they change a little bit every year, they're a little bit harder to find. So with viruses, we really like vaccines um, because they tend to we target something that is a area of the virus that is conserved, meaning it sort of stays with the virus um, through all of the generations of change. That's critically important to the virus. And if we can target that with a vaccine and an antibody that can take that out, then that's a great way to prevent infections. So I think in general, we've had, we have a lot more vaccines for viruses that work really well. Things like measles and rubella um, have been really effective um, and are great ways for prevention. Um, so I think you know, viral, um, viral treatments are just harder to develop. Um, and in general, we've, we've had um, less success with antiviral therapies than we have with vaccines. So Ebola is a great example where we tried a bunch of different antiviral therapies and it wasn't clear that any were perfect. Um, but once there became a vaccine that, that was available, it's really had a big effect in um, certain parts of the world where Ebola is more of a problem. And that's our hope with this is we get to a point where we can slow this down enough that we have vaccines that are available. And I think coronavirus um, and some of the coronavirus, um, you know, sort of lineage, particularly this type of coronavirus has the potential for being um, a, a vaccine. Uh, there might be a vaccine that could be used here. And there's a number of people um, that have been working on some vaccines like this um, related to SARS or other um, related um, um, coronavirus infections. So there's already been some preliminary work and those people have really ramped up their efforts to find that. But antivirals in general are just a little bit harder to develop um, because these viruses are small, they have fewer targets, and they can mutate more, more quickly because they replicate so fast. Um, so that is sometimes challenging. Okay, thank you so much for that one. Can we sure. double click on the immune compromised uh, area? Like most myeloma yeah. patients or patients on chemotherapy mm -hmm. or other immune compromising therapies in general mm -hmm. have low uh, absolute neutrophil counts, white blood cells sure. and lymphocytes sure. and IVIGs. Would yeah. patients benefit from uh, neutrogen shot, IVIG infusion, or other immune boosting methods specifically for this uh, disease or to avoid in general opportunistic infections? Yeah, I think, <clears throat> so for the first point, um, neupogen, I don't think so. Um, we don't think um, neutrophils themselves provide a huge amount of um, immune response to coronavirus. I think it's more the lymphocytes. Um, what we see is that people who are neutropenic or have low um, neutrophil counts, that tend to, tends to predict a general immune compromise rather than just that particular component. So neutrophils are really important for bacterial and fungal infections, but not as critical for um, viral infections. One of the reasons with bone marrow transplant, we see a lot of bacterial and fun fungal infections earlier post-transplant is because your neutrophils are low. And then as you go further out, as your immune system takes a while to recover, viral infections tend to continue to be problems for long periods. So um, it, I don't think getting neupogen shots is going to necessarily help in this particular situation, but it's a great, that's a great thought. And then IVIG, I think there's possibilities that that could be even eventually beneficial. The problem is, is at the moment, there's not enough community immunity to um, this particular um, virus. In the United States and in other parts of the world, um, there's not a lot of, um, of people who have, you know, that we know that they've been exposed to this. And so collecting... Um, immunoglobulin, we don't think we have enough of the antibody that would potentially protect you if you were given that particular strain. So as an example, um, with measles, after an exposure, we have measles-specific antibody that we can give to people that focuses, we know there's enough measles antibody in that, that we can potentially give it to you and protect you from getting measles complications. Um, with this, we don't know that yet. 
and some of the work <clears throat> around what's called serology or identifying people who have been infected is really progressing rapidly. And I think that'll be very helpful because once we identify who those people are, um, we can start collecting more immune globulin and having more targeted immunotherapies like immunoglobulin that has higher titers of this antibody against um, coronavirus that might be beneficial for people who are at risk. So I think, uh, you know, eventually that could be something that's developed over time. What I'm really excited about is thinking about it in a different way, is thinking about like monoclonal antibodies that we use for a lot of treatments for um, um, cancers like rituximab. Could there be a monoclonal antibody that is directed against coronavirus that identifies it and can help the immune system fight it off? So there's real interest in that area as a therapeutic. But unfortunately, there are no immune boosting strategies. I will tell you a couple of things that I think do help, though, um, and these seem very basic, but getting exercise, walking around your neighborhood and keeping fit is important, eating healthy. Um, so eating a really well-balanced diet and making sure you're taking in good nutrition can help your immune system function better. And then, frankly, getting enough sleep. So if you're spending your nights worrying about getting coronavirus, you may actually be putting yourself at risk. So sleep as much as you can. These seem like really basic things, but they do, they do really help. And then I think having a conversation with your oncologist specifically about what could be changed in your therapy to maybe lessen your immune system, um, to, to lessen your immune, um, immune suppression a little bit um, is something that is totally worthwhile if you're concerned. And that's a conversation that's really important because we don't want to change your immune responses and make your cancer worse. What we want to do is to do something that makes sense that can protect you. It's a, it's a balance. It's a really, really tight rope that we're, that we're walking. We don't want to put you in a situation where <clears throat> your disease gets worse and you need additional therapy, but we also want to help protect you against immune suppression if possible. And that's why I always re recommend talking to your oncologists who are really the experts in that area. Excellent. Priya, I think I will yield my last question. I think it has been answered around telemedicine, mm -hmm. home infusion, and uh, modifying uh, treatment. So I understand there are more questions in the pipeline, so I will yield back my yep. question. Okay. Thank great. you, Yelik. So we have Dana Holmes uh, dialing in. Uh, Dana, please ask your question. Okay. You have two hi, minutes. Priya. Yes, hi, Priya. Thank you so much. Hi, Dr. Program. My name is Dana Holmes, and I'm in New York City. I'm, I'm in the COVID yeah. epicenter of the United States right yeah. now, and I'll be honest with you, it's just been mind-numbing what's been going on. Um, yeah. With our current spread rate, I cannot help but believe that this virus was well-rooted in New York City before that yeah. first confirmed case was reported in early March. Um, yeah. I, I, you know, obviously we were just not testing then. Um, yep. In your opinion, do you think that this is really just our first wave, or might we see some relief as the warmer weather sets in? I'm hearing that <clears throat> could be a potential yeah. relief for us for at least a, a, a small portion of time. Yeah, um, I would love to give you a more optimistic response to that. Um, I'm not sure that's going to be true. Um, I think, first of all, um, I think you're right on your first point. I think coronavirus has likely been in New York for longer than expected. I mean, if you just think about travel patterns and how people move back and forth across the world, I mean, the fact that we had someone who'd been to Wuhan, China, who ended up coming back to Seattle or close to Seattle in Snohomish um, shows you that <clears throat> There's a tons of travel patterns, and, and actually um, one of the direct flights from Wuhan is to, um, I believe, to JFK. Mm -hmm. So the assumption was it probably um, was introduced at some point in time with some mild infection, and I think it probably has been in your community for longer than expected. Um, it is an issue that we didn't have adequate testing and we didn't know. Um, I think everyone in New York was working really hard to change that, but there were some issues in terms of how the testing was made available. Um, I know Governor Cuomo has really been um, instrumental in putting a really um, a robust attack in trying to take this on. And I know my colleagues who are in the centers in New York are working diligently to protect patients. So I think it's yeah. really important that there's a lot of work being done there. Um, what, what worries me a little bit about the summer component to this, and it may be true that maybe it lightens a little bit, um, but Peter Hotez, who's an expert and is actually um, is from Texas Children's, he's worked in um, 
in vaccines, um, actually trying to look at coronavirus vaccines, has been a little bit skeptical that's going to be true. Um, with a novel virus like that, like this, that spreads really well, um, where really no one who has, um, has never, none of us have seen this before, so all of us are at risk for getting it. It makes it easier to transmit. And, you know, sunlight can break down viruses a little better with UV rays. But what we've seen is there's a lot of transmission going on in Florida. And Florida, it's 80 degrees now. Yeah. And so I, I don't imagine that the summertime is going to be a period of relief, unfortunately. Um, what I expect is that New York will peak at some point in time with a large uh, amount of disease. And then there will be at some point in time, like all um, what we would call epidemic curves, Mm-hmm. They will start to come down as there's more community transmission and there's more people that are previously infected right. that have recovered <clears throat> so that the transmission is harder uh, for the virus. But, yeah, it, um, it, it's, it's like a, a wildfire right now. It's really it's, mm-hmm. it's mind-numbing. It's just incredibly yeah. mind-numbing. Yeah. And I think that, you know this, this, this is a virus that's really targeted towards um, places where there's lots of people together. The density. And mm-hmm. so... The density is hard because even if you want to do social distancing in New York, that's harder to do. And so I really empathize with you. So please be safe out there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. I I have a question. You mentioned lymphopenia as a a risk. Mm -hmm. And I've also Mm -hmm. read that it's listed as a common lab value in COVID patients. That's correct. Is it the virus which is also causing this or is it the infected patients already just have this? Yeah. So I think it's probably both. So probably some people have lymphopenia because of their disease and because you're on inability, um, because you have low lymphocyte counts, um, you're at more at risk for getting um, this particular complication and leading to complicated disease. But I think for sure, we've seen this with other respiratory viruses that um, in normal people, not people that are with cancer, is when their lymphocytes really drop, it tells us that there's an, like a large component of viral infection that's being engaged in that. And so some people think that is a predictor for the development of more complications. Um, uh, so lymphocyte okay. counts that are low are often a predictor of this and, and typically mean you have um, a viral infection. So that's not not a, not surprising. So I think it's a, like, okay. probably a combination of both. And, and regarding the, the antibody mm-hmm. process, um, do you yeah. believe that all COVID-infected and recovered patients will develop them, or will immunocompromised patients, such as myeloma patients, yeah. will develop a more limited antibody um, protective level? Yeah, we're, we're, we're trying to figure that out. Um, mm. Generally, when you look at things like flu vaccine, <clears throat> mm-hmm. you, don't, you don't really get as good of a response um, to the flu vaccine. Right. So my assumption is that your immune response to this virus will not quite be as good. And, but I don't know if that means that you'll potentially, <clears throat> you could get it multiple times in a season. I think that's probably less likely, mm-hmm. um, but we don't know. Um, we actually don't know a ton about the immune response, even in people that are normal hosts who recover. Um, this may be a virus that you get a, an immune response that's present for a period of time and then dissipates and then you're, el- you're eligible to get it again the next season. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Not sure. Um, so similar you know, to flu, like a, an influenza. <laughs> okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. We don't, I don't think it's going to be exactly the same. Um, I think it may be that some of these antibodies are not really visible, but if you re-expose someone, they increase. Um, we just don't know. So that's an yeah. outstanding question. Um, there's been hmm, some rumors that there is um, transmission, uh, that there's – you know, been people that have received this twice or gotten infected twice, but um, I haven't seen any real reports that indicate that that's um, true. These are all kind of word of mouth. And so until I see more data about that, I'm, I'm still pretty convinced that our immune systems are pretty smart and they can develop immune responses to um, a virus like this. But we don't know. Um, and I think that's something that will be coming in the future. But I think that question about immune compromised patients, my assumption is the immune responses will not be as robust. I think that's definitely true. Thank you, Dana. Uh, uh, Dr. Pergam, we have a few more questions from the audience. I know sure. we're almost uh, at the end of the hour, but if you have a few yeah. more minutes, it'd be really helpful. Sure. Yeah. Uh, sure. Just some quick responses. I'm not going to uh, 
pick up questions that we've already covered on immunocompromised patients, multiple myeloma patients being uh, immunocompromised as well as self-care regimens. What I'm going to ask is um, from one of our audience, the members who's listening says, what medicines should we uh, have if we become infected with the disease? So you're asking um, what medicines yeah. should you have at home? Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's a good question. So I think probably if you are getting a fever, um, um, having Tylenol is great because if you're having a high fever, it's great to try to, you know, prevent you from developing, um, un it's, it's uncomfortable to have a fever for a long portion of the day. So I think Tylenol is your best choice. Um, <clears throat> there's a question about, um, whether things like ibuprofen or other, um, non steroidal and anti-inflammatory drugs could cause more complications. Um, I, don't, I think the jury's still out about that a little bit, but I would probably um, uh, focus on Tylenol if you can. Um, that's probably a good thing for your fever and just follow the directions uh, that you don't take too much. Um, don't take it so that you can hide your fever all the time because you want to know when your fever is gone. Um, but if you're feeling feverish and you take your temperature and it's up, make sure you tell your doctor and then you can take some Tylenol to help relieve the symptoms related to that fever. Um, some people like to carry cough drops around. It can really help with um, the cough that might be associated with it. Um, some people who develop long um, cough and a lot of complications after they've recovered, um, they may need something like an inhaler for something like albuterol that can help them with a, that sort of bronchitis that can develop after an infection like that. And then I think, you know, for a lot of this is, um, you know, it's, it's mostly um, just things that make you feel better when you have a normal cold. So get a bunch of Kleenex in the house, um, have some wipes that you can wipe down um, um, to clean up spaces where you are. And um, if you have other symptoms related to this, talk to your doctor about what they can give you that can help relieve some of those. Um, but there's not a lot of great things. It's mostly symptomatic care more than anything else. So I think having a little Tylenol at home can be helpful. Um, and, uh, you know, whatever else makes you feel good when you have a, when you have a cold or flu. Uh, just a follow-up um, on uh, that. One, uh, one, other real, one other real quick comment. About, one other real mm -hmm. quick comment. People who do have yes. medications that they get regularly, make sure you have enough of them at home. Um, so what I do suggest to people is if they can go out and get enough um, medications for a couple of months that they have them in stock so they don't have to go to the pharmacy. But that's also, also helpful when you're ill that you can continue to take the medicines you need to for your treatment. Um, it's also really important if you do develop symptoms and you think you might have this to talk to your doctor about should you stop some of those treatments for a short period of time? That can be really helpful. But making sure you have your own normal um, medicines can be really helpful, particularly if you have pain medications or things that you're using on a regular basis. Make sure you have enough because you don't want to have to go to the pharmacy when you're sick. I'm sorry to interrupt you there. Go ahead. No, and that's fine. So as a follow-up, uh, like if you had contracted COVID and you're cured, uh, do you think treatments should be continued for a couple of weeks until the new cases of corona starts to decline? Um, that you're cured, you, you're, so you're cured, should it continue, should your treatment continue yeah. with COVID therapy? Yeah. Um, we don't think so. I mean, I think if you're cured and you, um, the virus is resolved, I, I think um, we would stop therapy. And we've had a number of those patients who've been treated and have um, come out on the other side and um, uh, we've been able to mm -hmm. either send them out of the ICU or they've recovered. And uh, we don't, we wouldn't continue therapy at that point in time. There's no reason to. Um, so, um, what we would do is we would, you know, still maintaining the way you are taking care of yourself at home, um, talk to your doctor about what you need to do for continued social distancing. Um, <clears throat> eventually, I hope when people start getting this that we can check antibody responses and see um, what you look like on the other side of the infection um, to see if you're really, you know, if you've had a good adequate immune response. But I, again, I'm not sure that we're going to have evidence that people are going to get infected multiple times. I think that seems less likely. Um, we just don't know yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Bergen. Uh, the next question uh -huh. is, how or by what mechanism is a virus destroyed over time? And he says, not uh, without washing with soap and water. And what temperatures, uh, if any, destroys a virus? <clears throat> yeah, so these are enveloped viruses. Um, so they have like a fatty layer on the outside. So using soap and water is a great way to break them down so they can't survive. Um, you can use alcohol hand sanitizer as well. That works well. Um, 
<clears throat> in terms of other things that break it down is time. So um, UV light over an extended period of time will break it down. Um, and it doesn't survive well. Um, it survives well on surfaces, but not for an extended period. So if you have something hmm, where it's been exposed, um, yeah. it can last on plastic for a little longer, metal, um, some cardboard. But, you know, if you leave these things out for a day or so, that usually is enough for the virus to, to not be able to survive. If you've got things like that, that you're worried might have had an exposure. And if you wipe them down with things like bleach and bleach um, mixes with water, um, that can be um, sufficient to clean it. So any sort of standard antibacterial wipe will usually work pretty well to break down this virus. Um, and in terms of temperature, when washing your hands, I don't think it really matters. I think it's really the friction and the, and the soap. <clears throat> but make sure you don't burn your hands because I know a lot of the myeloma patients do get um, some neuropathy, so be careful about that. Uh, so, Dr. Bergam, we did talk about clinical trials uh, right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a follow-up yeah. on that. Uh, what is available through compassionate use? Are there and are these available in local hospitals? Well, um, remdesivir was uh, initially um, offered as a compassionate use, but they've removed that because um, they had so many requests. So it's only available by a clinical trial, but they're working on getting a protocol open that you could open at individual centers that would allow people to get that drug, and that's just in process. Um, there are agents, some of these agents I talked about are already um, approved agents that we're using, um, like chloroquine and hydrochloroquine, um, that are available. Um, <clears throat> but there are no other agents that I know right now that are available for compassionate use specifically. Um, there is people that are working on um, these uh, immune sera, um, that could be given this passive transfer. Um, so that is ongoing work, and I think um, will eventually become available as well. Um, but at the moment, there are no other compassionate use trials that I'm aware of. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pergam. I think I'm going to wrap up with that one. Um, and thank you very much for your time uh, and the extra time, too. Uh, uh, Gary, sure. Jack, Cindy, and Yelek, thanks for participating. Uh, on March 11th, the World Health Organization yep. officially designated the novel coronavirus outbreak as a pandemic, uh, defined as a worldwide spread of a new disease, such as uh, such a declaration as was the first to be made since 2009 uh, when H1N1 swine flu was, disc uh, was declared a pandemic. So as of now, there have been approximately uh, for more than 400,000 confirmed cases of the COVID-19 disease, uh, and this is increasing as we speak. And this has resulted in more than 21,000 deaths worldwide. This is a critical time for information, support, and reassurance that signs and evidence can offer. Majority of us under, are under lockdown in our countries, counties, and states. So let's follow social distancing, wash our hands, and do our bit to flatten the curve. We can definitely overcome this if we stay together. So stay home and stay safe. On that note, thank you, everybody. Uh, the talk will be available on curetalks.com. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. And thanks, everybody, for the great questions. Have a great day, and stay safe.